and yeah, and I, I, I think we need to address the the million dollar question that I get asked all the time, but right. I'm sure you do as well. Yeah. Can anybody write a song? No. No. Hello and welcome to the Strong Writing Podcast, where we build our songwriting muscles together. My guest today is Billy Nomad, a songwriter and fellow entrepreneur from the UK who I'm very excited to talk to. Uh, Billy has been writing and producing music since 2005. He's played in a ton of bands and made a living from DIY touring, been a radio show host, a record label manager, you name it. Billy has been working on a course for new songwriters, which is sort of different from what I do, which is more geared towards advanced songwriters. Um, but I know a lot of newer songwriters listen to this podcast, so I'm excited to talk shop a little bit with Billy, discuss the ins and outs of songwriting, and uh, you know, hopefully get some actionable tips for beginners. And you know, who knows, maybe I'll have some tips myself to throw into the mix. If you're new here, make sure to subscribe to the show, and don't forget to leave comments and reviews wherever you are. That really helps me to reach more people. If you want some more, uh, or if you want some great free resources for songwriters, Make sure to head over to strongwriting.net right now for some great content that's going to help you be more confident, productive, and successful as a songwriter. And that's also where you'll find the show notes to each episode. All right. So thanks so much for joining me, Billy Nomad. Hello. How are you? I am doing very well. How is everything in your part of the world? Yeah, it's not too bad. It's gone a bit grey again. We had a few sunny days, but it's a bit grey again now, so I'm, I'm consigned to the inside. But just say thanks right. so much for having me on the podcast. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for coming. No worries. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Is it all right if I give it a go? No one does. <laughs> Is it a, Sorry? A, a, can I give it a go? Yeah. Is it a, a Vinder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. definitely close enough. Hey, Vinda. Okay. Have you got yeah. sort of like a, a short name? I mean, people call me Bill sometimes. Uh, AV. AV. Uh, yeah. Nice. It's nice That's... to meet you, AV, in, in the yeah, flesh. You too. Yes. Well, so to speak, yes. Mm. Pixelated flesh, but flesh nonetheless. You're right. You're right. Yes. <laughs> so um, before we get in, get stuck into the meat of the matter, Tell us a little bit about you and your journey as a musician and songwriter and and whatever else you, you do. Sure. I'd, I mean, it starts with me, I think, around the uh, age of seven or eight. I was an autistic child and so and I developed this uh, habit of writing letters to people to start with and I'm writing poetry for myself. And then eventually when I got to the point of learning musical instruments between the age of 13 and 15, and it become very much about songwriting rather than too much about learning the instruments and learning about music theory. It was very much right. for me um, kind of learning to express myself and uh, use the songwriting as a way of like pulling my, um, <laughs> pulling my, <laughs> I love how the screens are sort of bouncing. Yeah, I, I was, was awesome. <laughs> that was just, uh, I'm terrible when it, I'm learning how to use this thing and it's just uh, not going very well. Yeah, no, it's uh, fun. It looks amazing. It's so it's so posh. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Until I start messing with it, and all of a exactly. sudden, your name is Aventur, and I'm, you know, and and it's my face and your name. It's weird. <laughs> I'm a bit I'm of sorry. a video editor on the side as well, so I would love to, if I had some controls here. I'd be like doing extreme close-ups and text overlays and stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah, I, I think I started songwriting just as a way of expressing myself and putting my thoughts into words. And then as I got to growing up, I really wanted to do music as a job. So then I started to do all the things that you were just discussing, which was basically anything and everything I could do to, to earn my dough from playing right. music every day. Uh, and I'm still doing it now, more or less. You know, I think coronavirus definitely put a, a damper on things. But I'm still sure. managing to to write and record songs every day, which is really nice to be able to do. It's a real privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know, I think we're all familiar with the with the hustle um, and that mentality of where where is where is the money in this? Where mm. where do I go? To, I to, uh, yeah. I find, find I'm now it. I'm now, now as part of the record label. I'm advising a lot. I'm consulting with uh, artists that are just coming up, and I'm saying to them the best way of making it as a songwriter, as a 
as a thing if you want to do that as sort of a bit of a career rather than your full-time focus and you kill yourself career then the best way to do is think horizontally you know, what other jobs can you do aside from that that put in a bit of money so that your semi-main focus could be like right and I get to write songs now I get to release it online I get to collect my royalties and be happy and I get some lovely messages from people where they're like we listen to your music every Sunday and you know, things like that it's, it's really nice and to me uh, to be able to also be a teacher and to also be able to work with a record label, to also make films at times and write books. That's really nice. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's about, uh, it's about creative outlets. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. It's just about being creative for me. I think it started with songwriting and very much led to this lifestyle of just, I just want to be creative. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. So, um, you, focus on teaching beginners songwriting which is very uh, much yeah yeah which is very different for me because i uh yeah that's i i made a very conscious decision that i wanted to focus on songwriters that you know have some experience under their belt and know how to write a song but want to take that next step so i'm i'm very happy to uh because although i do have uh like a podcast episode uh, on my tips for you know writing your first song and things like that. That's not my sp specialty, if you will. So can, yeah, you can find yourself going round and round in circles when you're dealing with beginners, almost. Because I found it when I was teaching instrumental workshops. You know, you're doing the same five lessons over and over and over again because the people you're teaching are always beginners. By the time they're done with you, they move on to somewhere else, and that can be quite frustrating but it does allow you this area to hone in on your craft to really understand what how to deliver um an idea to a to a beginner and a variety of beginners right right um and um and yeah and i i, I think we need to address the the million dollar question that i get asked all the time but right. i'm sure you do as well yeah can anybody write a song no no, no, because not everyone is going to have the inclination to or there. And I think there's a lot in it, which is like motivation. You've, sure. uh, you've got to be motivated to spend the time learning how to do something. It's like, can everyone be a carpenter? And maybe if everyone had the inclination to be a carpenter, then everyone could learn to build a chair. But some people are going to get cut. Some people are, are going to, you know, they're going to find it too hard. Some people are going to get upset by the fact their first chair isn't perfect, so they'll stop doing it. Yeah. You know, so it does take real dedication and motivation to become it, to actually carry on for a long time and, and really find some value in it, I think. That's a great and very honest answer. It's um, talent, talent, man. I don't know if you've seen yeah. this guy. He teaches piano lessons. And he's like, oh, talent is just some made-up Greek word. I mean, talent mm. is time and lots of effort needed today. Right. That's talent. Oh yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> That's fantastic. I, you know, because because I've been asked that question, and I, I've kind of my answer has usually been, yeah, if you want to write a song, you can write a song. Yeah, of course you can. It but doesn't going to back perfect. to your point, you have to really want it. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, the point I make at the start of my thing is like, we're not going to be writing perfect songs here. We're going to be no. writing really loose, baggy songs that you're just going to try and understand what you're doing. Start the journey towards writing really yeah. good songs. And that's, you know, um, a part of what I teach my clients is very unsexy advice. <laughs> it's just, just write as many songs as you can. Right, yeah. It's about showing up and doing the work. Mm. And that's how you get better. And, you know, and so once you have the fundamentals, then you you kind of just have to keep doing it. And of course, uh, there's a lot of things involved in that. Like you said, motivation and yeah. all of that. But, you know, I always um, I always like it when when people talk about, oh, you know, it's it's uh, it should be quality over quantity. No, because it, they're the same thing. Quali yeah. Quantity begets quality. Exactly, exactly. Because then you get to choose what quality you put out there. There's nothing to say you have exactly. to release every song and promote it. And, oh, you know, and you shouldn't. Says, yeah, exactly. Some of should shouldn't. just be for you. Yeah, there's, yeah, the, yeah. there's a whole branch of my music that only recently I've started to go, okay, I think it's released a professional enough quality now that I'll start to release that. But for years and years, that was for me. Yeah, I mean, 
uh, my first solo album, I started with, I think, 20 songs. Right. And then I recorded uh, 15 or 16 of them. Yeah. And then I whittled that down to uh, to 11, or 10, and one was like an extra, like a downloadable. So you got an album out of 20 songs. And I, I see that across the industry as well. Um, there's a lot of great documentaries where you see bands putting together albums and they've got 30, 40 songs on a whiteboard and they're trying to decide which 12 yeah. they're going to stick on the CD, which eight they're sticking on the tape, you know, which 10 they're sticking on the vinyl. Yeah, wow, yeah, yeah okay, right. It, I think that's a wise thing to do because writing lo- more and more and more songs, not only have you got things that you can look at and go, right, what's the best of the best? But then if you need to go back and look at it like Green Day did with Uno, Doss and Trey, um, mm-hmm. they went, oh, well, we've got like 60 songs here. Let's make a triple album. So, right. So, um, and they were quite clear about these aren't our best songs. These are the B, B sides. These are the C sides. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah. um, enjoy them nonetheless. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's about doing it. You know, that's how you ultimately, no matter what you're doing, like you said about being a carpenter. Yeah. I'm, by the way, I've tried to learn to build things and I can't. Mm-hmm. I'm my just my hands don't. I'm not an accurate person. I, yeah, I can't paint. To, I can't paint. I just can't do it. I can do that. That's right. something that I'm actually fairly. I I can paint without using tape. Even I'm oh, right. I'm pretty good at that. Uh, but um, but when it comes to building, I'm my I'm not accurate at all. I can't I can't measure accurately. So everything I built a home studio where I used to live in my garage. Yeah, like a proper like walls and like the whole shebang. You know, wow. like sound isolation and everything. Every there was not a uh, 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 there was everything was crooked. Everything there was not a straight line in the house. It was so bad. <laughs> Did you look uh, back at the end and go, "Oh, look at him!" and just watch it collapse? It, it, <laughs> I'm I'm still surprised that I'm not like buried under there. I tried to build my mixing desk, I, um, so basically my studio desk in my old bedroom, and there was several sets of lines up the wall where I'd gone, maybe there, maybe there, maybe there. And by the yeah. time it finished, I sat down in my chair, and no lie, the desk came up to my chest here. <laughs> I was like, oh, I can't type like that. So I just got into the habit of having my keyboard on my legs. And that's what I always do now. I've got my keyboard on my legs down here. So, yeah. But luckily, this desk is at a normal height. In fact, for me, it's a bit too low now. It just feels weird. I've got a desk that raises and lowers. Oh, no. That's too posh for me. That's quality of life there, you know. <laughs> yeah, man. I got it. I got it like it, it really cheap. I couldn't have afforded it new. It was some company was getting rid of some furniture, and I got it for like, mm. nothing. Yeah, you can't say no to free things. I had a friend once that yeah, turned out yeah. a free cookie from Subway, and I just gave him the the bowl. Just went like, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> yeah. yeah, but <coughs> um, but no, that's. I mean, honestly, it's it's. Um, I think we're on the same page here. It's it's about it's about doing the work, but when it comes to um, when it comes to somebody who's never written a song, right? Even perhaps somebody who doesn't have musical experience. What do you what do you tell that person when they come to you? Hey, you know what can you teach me? What do you tell them? I tell them that they've got to start to listen to music in a slightly different way. Because and and I will warn them that they'll break the way they think about music, um, and you know it starts with not listening to it necessarily from an emotional point of view as you would as a consumer of music, but really whittling it down to what you might call the mathematics of it, you know, right. and the the strategy of it. There's a lot of different things that are put in formulate things. Um, uh, that you can really tap into and understand just by listening to music, but you have to be listening out for them. For instance, mm-hmm. starting out talking about verses and choruses and middle eights and you know different structural parts of songs that they would have never heard the language for. They never understand what they are. They just know that it's a movement within a popular song that they enjoy. Uh, yeah. And talk to them about how to maybe differentiate bet- uh, between them as a songwriter. Right. And then talking about lyrical construction, a lot of what I've put into this course is talking about lyrical construction, how you go from just having a melody to um, you know, coming up with a really well-defined and well-meaning 
line and you don't always have to do that you'll know yourself when you're writing songs you can just put together songs um for the sake of it i actually yeah. um there's a line in one of my most popular songs happy man where i clearly say i'm singing sad songs for the sake of it yeah you know? and um yeah, you can just be doing that and i wrote another song years and years ago where i actually laid out what i was doing um in the lyrics and the lyrics were i'm putting love into words i'm putting pencil to verse you know, and all these different things that it just was poetically describing how i was putting together songs and why i was putting together songs but really yeah, looking at lyrical construction, you start off by thinking, well, it's all about inspiration, isn't it? It's all of these things start from, I feel bad today. I feel good today. Uh, I, I, this happened, that happened. And you start to, you know, with your one-liners, go, ah, okay, that's an inspired one-liner. And what does that inspire after the fact? Um, right. But by understanding different poetic structures um, that songwriters might use, so listening to a lot of songs, Yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. And taking that, that mm -hmm. exact thing, stealing it, cookie-cuttering it, and going, right, so I want you to make your own lyrics up to that. Just make up silly lyrics like Paul McCartney did. I think he yep. said... Um, scrambled eggs. Scrambled eggs. Oh, yep. my darling, you have lovely legs or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. And doing that, doing that yourself and kind of going, okay, I'll make up a silly verse and then talk about melodic construction. So you go, okay, how can you change the melody slightly to, to get a different feeling line out of that? Okay, and, right. and that's really what I try and do. I try and get people to understand what other songwriters are doing. Because it's mm -hmm. like, if you want to be a good carpenter, sorry to keep going back to that point, and yeah. I don't know why I'm doing it, but I'm, you really... Have... It's triggering me, man. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm really good at making walking sticks because they're just one long <laughs> shaft of wood. I can't make chairs. Yeah. I really can't. <laughs> uh, but you'd have to look and understand what a chair is and how it works and what where yeah. the support comes from and all that. So without doing those things, you can't just like get a hatchet and go, right, I'm building a chair today. Right. Well, I mean, I'd argue that you can... Okay. And yeah. That's that's how I started out. Certainly, songs. me me too. I didn't know I, any rules. No, I had no idea what I was doing, uh, and I didn't know. I, I knew a little bit of uh, music theory, but uh, not like practical, like the the practical music theory for songwriting. I knew chord structure and things like that, so yes. I could I could figure out any chord. You know, I could sit down at a keyboard and I could figure out. Okay, so how does this work? Because I I learned watching a keyboard, even though I studied guitar. Yeah, uh, I kind of learned to feel it out with chord structures. It's funny, yeah. when I started to learn scales and uh, chord charts for scales, I was like, oh, man, I kind of had it figured out without knowing I had it figured out. It yeah, was it like was sort of the things. same with me. Yeah. But it, it, it took me many, many, many years to learn. And, and actually, even when as an adult and I had already written a bunch of songs, I learned about the circle of fifths. Oh yeah! Oh my God! This is uh, this is a revelation. This is I, I knew that C and F go well together, but I yeah, never knew why. why. And A minor, <laughs> you go, you go. Why are all of my songs going C G A minor F, and then the chorus is going A F um, C yeah. G? You know, oh yeah, right, exactly. it's because they're cousins. Right, it's, it's because that's how music works. Okay, yeah. I understand now. Yeah, okay. Uh, it, it, but before I was like, okay, I have to try out every single chord I know and see which one fits. <laughs> And then it was sort of, oh, there's a shortcut. Uh, see, one thing I love to do now as someone who's quite an experienced is, is make it up still, break the rules. So, oh, yeah. Go an E, F sharp major yeah. to, a, to an A major. And you go, oh, man, that's not really, that's not, you're breaking the rules in a few right. different ways there. But it sounds great. And if you put piano sort of complementary melodies in certain parts, yeah. then it starts to really come together and, and take on some character. Absolutely. And but here's the thing, what I have found when it comes to those sorts of things is that um, I once I learned, once I knew the rules and I knew why I was breaking them, it started to feel uh, it started to be just become natural. Yes. So, you know, so, um, you know, inserting a, an E major in a C major song. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't it doesn't belong there, but it makes this it lifts the song, and uh, this is actually my theory. I keep I tell everyone this because I this is something that I came up with, and I'm I I believe in it strongly. Is that I I I think I've solved how how hooks work 
in All right. songs. Please. So uh, a hook is like a punchline in a joke. Right. So if because I used to I used to do stand up comedy. And I wrote uh, a thesis about stand-up comedy when I was at university. Amazing. And uh, and joke structure is pretty simple. You have a, a setup and a punchline. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and makes sense. And the, the job of the setup is to misguide you, and then the punchline breaks your expectations. So yeah. the setup sets up certain expectations, and then there's a surprise. There's a twist. And that's what makes you laugh. Especially when you look at like knock knock jokes and chicken cross and the road jokes and things like that. You certainly see. And yeah, even... those are like the simplest, uh, the simplest form of jokes. I mean, I don't know um, if you heard about the controversy around the Jimmy Carr joke recently, uh, his Holocaust joke, but that was a perfect one because that actually put that in the mind of the audience. They did that to themselves right. with that joke, and that's quite clever. You know, they set yeah. their own expectations, and then they kind of they blew their own expectations by laughing, and it's like, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and and of course, you know, there's you could go into a whole complicated uh, uh, discussion of how that works exactly, but. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's surprise. It's laughter is a defense mechanism, but yes. it, it's but it's it's like a pleasant surprise, mm. and um, and uh, to me, I think that a hook in a song is the same thing. You take something familiar and you twist it a little bit, and you I... make it a little bit surprising. So that way, you know, if you if you take, um, uh, you know, like. You know, like you said, uh, C A minor F G, yeah, the most common uh, chord progression in the world, probably. Uh, well, aside from like the blues, you know, but but yeah, you know, one of, of the most, yeah, yeah. Uh, but definitely take the most that one, popular uh, pop standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you t you take that one, um, and then you switch out uh, one of the chords for something different. Then immediately that's, or maybe you only do it like every third time or something. Then you do an uh, E minor instead of the G or whatever. Then, <laughs> yeah, I can remember you know, a song in particular that you used to do it, and it used to irritate me when I listened to it because you'd expect the G at the resolve, but instead it was like an F major seven or something. You go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, but that there you go. That you remember that song, right? Yeah, absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent. So, so I think that you know, both in terms of musical hooks and lyrical hooks, that's kind of um what 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 sets sticks in your mind is something that that breaks your expectations a little bit mm. but still is familiar enough for it to feel comfortable yes you know and that's why very very weird songs rarely have that same catchiness because they're too far out there and they're not familiar enough yeah that um, makes sense I, I, so, so that to me is, you know, so that's uh, uh, another reason why I think that, you know, learning the rules and, and knowing when you should break them and when you should not yeah. is important. And I think it, that with that in mind, it very much depends on someone's objective when it comes to songwriting, because you know, is it because uh, you want to sit and experiment with music on your own terms and uh, you know, cathartically express yourself? Or is it because you want commercial success? And definitely right. if you're heading towards uh, commercial success, the more rules you know, the better. And actually, yeah. um, it's not just then about the rules of music, it's the rules of the industry as well, you have to know. Um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think when I started out, it was just with a guitar and in three chords and I made up the rest and uh, sure. I still very much sort of stick to those bass set of chords. And I just started to learn, um, I don't want to set the world on fire by the ink spots. And that's like the most challenging song I've learned in terms of jazz chords and things. Um, right. <laughs> but you know, really, I didn't know the rules. But like I said earlier, I've definitely found a few on my own. And I think naturally a lot of these rules exist because people naturally find their way towards these things it's like you say familiar um yeah nursery rhymes are something that's so familiar to all of us and the amount yeah. of times i lean on nursery rhymes in my songwriting because i know that it's something that immediately people will hear and go i know that yeah. um you know the the nursery rhyme run rabbit run rabbit run 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 the farmer's gonna get you with his big bad gun or something it's Don't think uh, i know that it's an old folk song as well, but basically I changed the melody for that um, and yeah. turned it into Run Rabbit, which ended up being one of the most popular songs from my first album. 
Um, and yeah. I think because of that, it's because the first sign is you better run, rabbit, run, rabbit, run. The farm's going to get you with this big bad gun. <laughs> yeah. But certainly for people that are aware of that folk song and that nursery rhyme, yeah. they'd go, oh, well, okay, that relates to me straight away. I get, I get what he's trying to say here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a, um, I did a song for my for an upcoming album that I've been working on for years, um, which is uh, is called Little Pig. Nice. And it's it's got this whole story, but the whole thing is based around nursery rhymes. So there's you know the uh, three little pigs, there's a uh, little boy B blue, little Bo Peep. It's all in there, um, and uh, you know and 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 that sort of you know touching on those. I do this a lot. This is a part of what I teach too. Is you know uh, when you're coming up with lyrical ideas, start with you know cliches or references or yeah. or whatever you can. And it's the same principle. It's you know find those things that people are familiar with and put a twist on them and then you're gonna you're gonna hook them tom waits does this all oh, the i time. love tom waits for that and exactly that yeah. that's one of my biggest influences when it comes to that sort of like playing with a nursery rhyme yeah, um, yeah, yeah, play, playing with the really like uh mundane and making it something almost dark uh, and really yeah, meaningful exactly there's there's a line from the start of one of my songs do you feel it and it's on the album airwave invasion which is on my band camp. It's like one of these albums that you can only get in one very specific place. Right. Um, and it's a song called Do You Feel It? And it was a song I was writing about society at large, but from a very innocent perspective. And so right. the first line is, poor me, silly old me, tricks are for kids and I fell for free. You know, and um, it's that tricks are for kids thing that like really came to me first. It was kind of like, you know, as adults, we don't think we're susceptible for for tricks and cons and and sure. things like that, you know. Um, but actually, you know, we're still very childlike and naive at times. So, for especially an American audience who are very much aware of, you know, silly rabbit tricks are for kids. You know, that's going <laughs> to relate to them, and it's going to relate to that child in them that remembers that. And so that's where yeah. I was coming from with that line. Um, but also, it says a lot about other things, like uh, say the naivety of adults. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's uh, yeah, that's that's uh, uh, great. And and speaking because we're we're talking about um, you know we were talking about Tom Waits and and all uh, that. Yeah. Um. Uh. One of the things that you talk about is uh, learning from other artists. That's right. And uh, I'd love to to hear your take on that. Like, how do you how do you go about learning from your favorite artists? Um. I suppose. So like I was saying to you earlier, I'm not sure if we're on the air or not, but I take sometimes a very holistic approach to my songwriting. So when I listen to an artist, I tend to listen to them a lot. Um, and I right. tend to become quite obsessive. I did download their entire discography and I'll listen to them a lot. And if I like someone, I'll try and get all their records and you know, I'll listen to them. And I guess what I do, I kind of assimilate some of their style. Mm -hmm. Now, if I was to say to you, Kings of Leon, and you went back and you listened to the entire back catalogue of Billy Nomad, there might be one or two songs in there that you go, oh, that sounds a bit like Kings of Leon. But right. there was a certain something that I listened to around that time that I was like, yes, it's that. And I suppose with Kings of Leon, it was, because I was listening to the very early albums first, and it was the fact that they were kind of like these um, neck of the woods or like country boys that had a studio that could basically make up whatever poetry they wanted. The lyrics were more or less meaningless, you know, and mm -hmm. they were just having a wild time. And because I was in punk bands at that time, it was like, yeah, this suits me perfectly. So I guess the attitude and the music that came off from Kings of Leon, where I suppose lyrically, definitely from the Beatles and Bob Marley, Paul Weller, mm -hmm. you know, and people like that that were really talking about social issues and, and different things. So that kind of what I took from them was just kind of the bravery to, to kind of go, and now I'm going to talk about this thing that's really personal to me. A lot of yeah. songwriters, I think, struggle with that to start with. They go, oh, right. it doesn't really, it's not really what I'm trying to say. And you get that emotionally. So oh, don't you, you're in a difficult conversation. It's really hard yeah. to find the right words. So it's no different with writing a song. Um, yeah. And I guess, yeah, from, from a lot of the other artists like that that I was listening to. The Police as well. The Police are fantastic. When you listen to Man in a Suitcase, that perfectly kind of described how I was feeling when I was touring at first. And I'm going from this place to the next, go from this place yeah. to the next. And I'm just a man in a suitcase. I live in hotel rooms. You know, um, yeah, and and so from that, you know, it's it, being able to talk about mundane and every single, like, 
boring thing in your life. I, I talk about tea and toast quite a lot. Um, yeah. So it's um, and pot noodles. I think got a mention years ago. I think I mentioned pot noodle in a song because it was yeah. it's a big factor in my life was eating pot noodles. Yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, like going back to your question, I think listening to Tom Waits, you do just kind of pick up a little something from each person. It's a grey area, isn't it, between plagiarism and inspiration? Yeah. yeah. If you listen to a song and you go, right, I'm going to copy that entirely and I'm just going to change the lyrics or one chord, then that's probably yeah. not very creative. No, but, you know, uh, my experience is that, um, especially when I was learning the craft, uh, I spent a lot of time learning to play my favorite songs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I learned to sing my favorite songs. I think that's where I got a lot of ideas for vocal melodies from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that would kind of lead me to learn new chords uh, and learn and get ideas for chord progressions that I never would have thought of. Mm. And I use this as uh, a trick to get out of a rut. And I, 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 uh, I have a, an episode... I think it's. I think uh, there was an episode up on the podcast um, that's like ways to get out of a songwriting rut, right. and one of them is to just go on a, one of those guitar chord websites and find a song you've never heard. Yeah, and play those chords. Okay. There's no way you're plagiarizing the song because you don't know the song. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, I and mean, a lot of these things. Every like every chord progression has been anyway. done. Yeah, they're all standards. So, yeah, it's you know, it's there's there's only so many ways you can put uh eight chords together. Absolutely. So, so that's you know, that's a that's one thing that uh it's a very I, I call it ethical plagiarism. Yeah, and I think in a similar way, like the reason I'm learning World on Fire by the Ink Spots at the moment is because I wanted more ideas on different chord shapes and doing so you can guarantee the next Billy Nomad song is gonna have some really jazzy chords in it. Um, yeah. And am I stealing those chords directly from the song? In a way, but I'm like putting them to a different use, definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, I remember I learned uh, an arrangement. Uh, I was playing in a funeral, and they asked me to play uh, Amazing Grace. Oh, nice. Just instrumental on a guitar. That's a beautiful song. So, yeah. Uh, so it was just, you know, as they were carrying the casket out of the church, I was playing that, you know, um, just solo on a, an acoustic guitar. Wow. And uh, so I, I just, I found some arrangement somewhere and learned it. And it was so beautiful that I, I went and I took the, like the scales and the melody shapes from that. And I wrote a song ar around that. Oh, uh, nice. So it was, it was nothing like Amazing Grace. Yeah, yeah. But it was just using the ideas that I learned from that arrangement. And I think that's kind of what, I th at least that's kind of the sense that I'm getting from you. Like what, what you get from, from other people's music is, you know, you can take those, you can take ideas and, uh, and kind of develop them for your own purposes. And that's not. Absolutely. That's, that's 100% right. Yeah, and that's not that's not you know uh, I don't think that's ever gonna. I mean, of course you have to be careful not to to stay too close to the original. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like you know, like chord progressions, chord shapes, uh, uh, scales that you've never seen before, uh, stuff like that is is very useful to to yeah. pull from others others' music. I find it very interesting. I saw a meme a while back. I mean, but basically what it was, was, um, you know, old, old classical music industry. Hey, bro, yeah. I've just decided to pay homage to your concerto in my latest work. You know, and the other one yeah. being like, thanks, bro. And then the modern music industry, <laughs> like I took one line, I'm going to kill you, you know. And, it, that's sort of <laughs> yeah. sentiment. and it's quite interesting to see that as intellectual property and copyright licensing and things as as the music industry has commercialized more and more, it's become yeah. harder for people to be honest about the fact that everyone's inspired by everyone else. So, and actually, yeah. you listen to Brahms or you listen to Beethoven, you might hear a couple of things that cross over and go, oh, I wonder if they kind of knew each other or were inspired by each other. Right. Yeah. 
I, I going back to Tom Waits, he had I, I forget the exact quote, but basically what he said was that uh, you know every artist is just imitating other artists and doing a bad job. <laughs> That's how you develop your own sound by <laughs> imitating others badly. Yeah, badly, and then kind of. Well, I think everyone kind of develops a thing that is them. You know, I've yeah. certainly, I feel like the character that I've brought up through my music is, you know, it's it's somewhat me. Uh, but then I can see all of the different things that have gone into make it together. And I suppose when you listen to Bob Marley, there's no mistaking that that's anyone else. You know, songwriting right. style, performance style, everything. That's a Bob Marley tune. Um, but then you listen to a lot of people like Neville Staple, uh, you know, and a lot of other people that are in that scene with him at that time. Yeah. Uh, you go, ah, at least Scratch Perry, for instance, who was a, apparently a massive influence in Bob Marley's life. You start to see where all those different things that make up Bob Marley come from. And I love yeah. that. I really do. That's one thing I love to do when I listen to a new band is kind of sit there and whittle down who I've heard that are similar to them. And we were doing it at the radio station the other night and my friend Emma turned around to me and went, oh, no, no, not that one. It sounds nothing like that. And I love that she's, that she's able to kind of go, no, I'm not hearing that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like we yeah. all hear different things in the songs, don't we? Yeah, same with, I mean, same with Tom Waits. You know, you talk about somebody who's instantly recognizable. Uh, when you hear a Tom Waits song, that's obviously a Tom Waits song. There's yeah, no... absolutely. Hoist That Rag is one of my favorite Tom Waits songs. <laughs> I love and Hoist That there Rag. Is, yeah. There is no mistake, and that's why anyone. That's, uh, yeah, exactly. But but still, you know, you can break it down. I mean, uh, Captain Beefheart, yeah. obviously. Um, the Rat Pack in the earlier yeah. stuff. You know, you Especially the solely stuff. Enough. Yeah, the, the, the swingy stuff, I should say. Yeah, yeah. The swingy stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and even, you know, before that, even, you know, Bob Dylan yeah. and, uh, Woody Guthrie, that sort of stuff. And then, you know, later on you hear even, uh, in his later, you can hear like Wu-Tang Clan influences. Yeah. So you can break it down to a lot of different, uh, influences. The, uh, yeah. the uniqueness is that what he, like the Frankenstein monster that he creates from those different parts that's the secret sauce. It's funny that you said earlier, you know, write songs and write a lot of songs. And that's something that Tom Waits has done over many, many oh, yeah. years. And he's always stayed in touch with music. He likes the music yeah. that's out right now and makes a point of listening to it. And I think that's really important is not to kind of have your ideas and then get cornered by, okay, I write songs like this. Exactly. And still to branch out and keep on learning. There's, there, you're never going to get an expert songwriter out there. Um, unless you've know, been doing it for years and years and years, unless they're an old sage in a cave going, right, I'll teach you how to write a hit song every time. You know, I can't consider <laughs> anyone a um, an expert songwriter. But then it, it's not always about getting hits. Um, and I, I do no. try to make a point of telling people, especially beginners, if you're getting into it to make hits and to, um, yeah, to make money off it, you're probably setting yourself up for failure in some ways. Um, but don't lose hope be objective well, and you know you can make a career from it i think i think if, you, if you're getting into it to have hits and get rich then yes you're setting yourself up for failure yes but you know i think i i use myself in, as an example of you know i'm not a commercially uh viable product if you will right. you know i'm i'm not the kind of song or i don't write pop you know i i write stuff in you know like tom waits is my biggest songwriting influence i want to hear know. some of your music now you must send me some yes after the show. see this, this is just this has been a whole sales pitch for my music that's <laughs> all this has been the best um, plug ever <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh um but yeah i'll hook you up when we're done but, uh it's you know my um yeah, I, I you know it's a Nick Cave and Neil Young that sort of so that's the kind of stuff that I write, which is yeah not although uh, in Iceland lately there's been like a country resurgence and I'm um, sort of I, I dabble in in that area, uh, but on the whole I'm not writing music that's going to be played on the radio a lot. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, or or going to make like the huge Spotify playlists or whatever. Mm. But there is an audience for pretty much everything yes you know as long as it's decent quality and and there's uh there's always a way to you know find your way to to make 
a living from what you do. And uh, for me, most of the most of the sort of jobs that I've gotten as a songwriter has been in theater because, uh, well. as you can imagine, writing the kind of music that I do, mm. it is very theatrical. And so it lends itself very well to theater. Awesome. And, That's something I've wanted uh, to do. I've got a musical written, but I have yet to approach it. Right. So, you know, so that's kind of, um, you know, and, and so that that's, you know, I've been like doing that professionally now for, I don't know, seven, eight years or something. How, do you uh, enjoy that? Is is that? It's, it's wonderful. It's very stressful at times. I've just come off uh, a massive uh, undertaking, like the most technically complex show I've done. And I'm usually in the shows as well because I'm an actor too. So wow. it's kind of like a, it's a good deal. You know, you get music and you get an actor and you get the whole thing. Um, write the theme tune, sing the theme tune. I don't know if you exactly, ever remember exactly. that. But... <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, uh, uh, yeah, so it can be very stressful, but it is so rewarding and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I'd love yeah, to. Just come off that. That's my, my skin is all messed up. I just shaved off my beard because I'm covered with eczema and stuff. Oh, um, bless you, mate. From all the makeup. No, because I had a beard. Uh, oh, so I didn't right. put on makeup there. But uh, but stress plus uh, a beard for me equals uh, skin issues. Yeah, I like to so, keep my, my nice and short. Yeah, I usually have a beard. This is unusual for me. It's hard. It's weird for me to see my face there and it's naked, <laughs> and it's just odd. This is the but, first uh, time I met your face, so to me, you're <laughs> yes, awful. exactly. You're used to this. <laughs> I'm not. Well, next time uh, I see the beard, I'm gonna be like, oh god, I don't like this new look. No, no this is no, <laughs> terrible. Don't shave that off quickly. Um, but um, but so so I would say you know there's uh, there is a an audience and a market for everything. You just, it, it might take a little time to find it. Uh, and, and that's one of the key things is you need to find it. It's yes. not going to find you. Yeah. The, if, the interesting thing is, is that the, one of the first things that got me into the industry as a professional in the industry was that I heard a figure that every artist needs a thousand patrons. You know, as long as those a thousand yeah. patrons are paying a hundred pounds a year, say that artist is earning a hundred thousand pounds a year. Yeah. You know, so once you take off margins, it's a little like less realistic, you know, when you look at that. But the, there's a fundamental yeah. message in there is that really there's eight billion people on the planet. And if you're willing to work on your craft and build a community around it, which is what a lot of people forget, they become isolated and alienated. But build a community yeah. around it. Um, be the person that's always playing music outside the local coffee shop and you'll start to make some headroom with it. It, it became really important for me in my late teens just to busk. Busking was hugely yeah. important um, because not only did it get to me to try on new songs, but I could earn money from playing my songs. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and we were discussing before we started recording, uh, there's a website called Street Jelly. Yes. Um, because I live in Iceland and uh, it's there's no busking scene here. Oh, bless so, you. Uh, um, it's just, it rains too much. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's uh, one thing I, I my busking cal calendar is March to September and I say that starch yeah. till Stoptober because honestly you can only yeah. start in March and stop in September because otherwise the weather is too unpredictable yeah but I still have friends that go out and busk between September and March they are nutters but I do fully respect yeah. them sure mm -hmm. uh there are people who do busk here but um uh very few and I don't think they make pretty much any money but um uh it's a different place but uh we don't have a, we don't have the culture we don't have a busking culture right. but streetjelly.com is a website that i encourage uh people to check out because that's like an online busking thing you can go on there and you can play for a little bit it's not like you know because live streaming is hard and you have to do it for hours on end. constantly for hours on end yeah, it's yeah. consistency yeah, but uh, Street Jelly, you can go on and play for a half an hour and, and you'll probably get some people, uh, maybe only a few, but if you do it regularly and you like do it at the same time every day or, or every week or whatever, yeah, then... Start you know. to build familiarity with people. And and it's horrible to say this, you know. Um, there's that old saying, isn't there? It's not what you know, it's who you know. And I do think yeah. it is weighed more towards, if you want success, it's who you know. 
if you want yeah. personal success, you want to become a better songwriter, it's definitely about what you know. But then yeah. once it comes to being successful within the industry, it's about learning how to network and then it's learning yeah. about how to market your sound. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And and that's what I mean by saying that, you know, it's <clears throat> uh, you have to find your shelf, if you will, your yeah. niche. Uh, it's not going to find you. You know, you need to find, you know, you, you're making your music. And and I always say, this is a quote that I heard somewhere, and I don't know who said it. Um, it might have been Quincy Jones, but I, I'm not sure. But it was, it's the greatest quote that I've ever heard, and I quote this all the time, is um, find out who you are and be the shit out of that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I like that. That's the best advice I have ever gotten as an artist, and it's the best advice I can give anyone. Uh, because it's, it's as long as you just figure yourself out and are true to your yourself and your vision, then there is an audience. What you need to do is be proactive and get out there, get in as many different venues as you can. Uh, try out, you know, maybe theater is for you. And so yeah. then try contacting some local theater groups and see if they need music for a show. Maybe that's, you know, maybe you try it and it's not for you. That's fine. You've tried it. So now go, you know, maybe. And my next thing is now I want to get into music licensing for film and TV. Awesome. And so, yeah, I've seen that's a really valuable avenue, especially in yeah. games as well. Uh, games, movies, yeah. TV, games, definitely yeah, games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and I've, I've actually worked in the uh, games industry. Have you? Um, awesome. Not, as, not in terms of music. I yeah. did marketing for a, a spell as, awesome. in, uh, in gaming. Um, but uh, so that's what I'm doing now. And and the one of the biggest parts of that right now is I'm I'm networking and I'm getting I'm learning through through this podcast. You know, I've 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 had a couple of people on and I'm having another one very soon. Um, people who, you know, know the industry and have given me a lot of tips. And so, you know, I this this really for me, for the most part, this podcast is kind of like a learning opportunity for me. I need people. And, and networking too. I mean, I'm not ashamed to 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 t say that. You know, I, uh, I I like to connect with the people that I get on here. And uh, my uh, the thing about musicians and music is that it's such a community thing. Yes, there's it's it's a huge thing to look at in terms of community growth rather than a music industry profession. Yeah, I I mean, I think that. Uh, if if you're being competitive as an artist, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You know, you should always be happy for your fellow artists' success because whenever somebody gets successful, that means that there is more potential for you to get successful because yeah. they're leaving. You know, if somebody gets, um, I've never understood the uh, you know people getting jealous of others getting a big break because them moving on means that there's now a vacancy where they used to be. Yeah, so I definitely think there's a... there's definitely a lot of mental health problems within um, you know the oh, yeah. creative community, and I think that that kind of inexplicable jealousy and hatred towards and resentment, and I often found it when I was touring, and it was the younger bands that I'd meet, not necessarily individuals, but bands I'd meet that you'd walk into the green room being a seasoned you know musician, going hello yeah. everyone, how are you doing, and they kind of stand there giving you this look like who are you. <laughs> You know, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. like no, no, chill, chill out. You know, like this is we're in freedom land now. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they, there can be a lot of that. And I think it does stem from like you know, certain unknowns and fears, but definitely a lot of creatives that I know do suffer from some mental health problems. That's uh, actually a, a topic that I talk about a lot: is yeah. creativity and mental health. And I think there's a uh, that's a really double edged sword. I actually did a whole episode on it. I've done public talks on it as well um because on one hand creativity and creative endeavors are really good for my mental health and mm -hmm. for a lot of you know a lot of people get a lot of release and and stuff like that but uh on the other hand i think it's very common that people think that uh their mental health issues are somehow helpful in their creative pursuits and that is very did. dangerous i certainly did for a very long time and it was yeah. um as if i couldn't bring myself to write the next album unless i was willing to sabotage my social life and my professional life and go back to my bedroom in my mom and dad's house you know yeah. there's a real sort of negative cycle that i was in 
Um, yeah. And it didn't help my songwriting. So it's like you say, you're, no. you're better off writing more songs. You know, so be in a good state of mind. I didn't realise until recently, I'd, I, I live like a prince now. You know, okay. I can afford to eat. I can afford my rent. You know, I've, um, I've got all my musical instruments around me. If I want to wake up that day and record, write and record a new song, I can just do that. Yeah. And that's a real, real privilege. And the thing is, I think society at large doesn't realise how easy life can be in terms yeah. of you know, what we actually really need in terms of medical infrastructure and food production. You know, you could take someone like me and go, right, OK, this week you need to do four to six hours worth of food production work. And I'd probably go, OK, yeah, it'd be good exercise. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I think definitely when you look at um, where mental health lies within the music industry is you've got these, these particular people who are who lean towards a certain mindset and a certain condition and i certainly did because uh my asperger syndrome my autism was untreated unrecognized and that helped me to develop complex ptsd and bpd you know so Mm -hmm. quite um serious uh uh, mental health concerns but a lot of that was self-perpetuating because i was a songwriter and i was trying to work in the music industry so you're very right you have to be aware of that and you have to be wary of it and not pursue it i know people that are in their 40s and 50s and still in that negative cycle and yet when you look at their careers abstractly they're not any further on they're still doing the same four pubs they're not making any money from it and they're slowly their character is diminishing they're dying uh it's such a sad thing to see um but i really try and advise young people against that and kind of go no just be creative and positive you know can we build a community Uh, that seems to be the best way and if you're if your mental state is such that you feel like you have to um uh you know engage in negative behavior in order to draw a song out then i would suggest seeking counseling not continuing to write songs you can write songs oh, yeah. once you're in a better state of mind i honestly would because for years i did it and then as soon as i sought therapy i was like you know this hasn't broken my ability to write songs you know, i can yeah. still write perfectly good songs and perfectly well-meaning songs you know? and actually i wrote my first few positive songs for the first time yeah. in years recently and that was really nice yeah you know? i mean um what I always, uh, it, it's it's such a vicious cycle, and I did this for years too. I've suffered from depression and anxiety Bless for you. most of my life, um, and um, and it's an ongoing struggle, mm. uh, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, it's not something that goes away ever. But no, I woke up in a miserable mood the other day, and yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah. I mean that that happens. You know, I have my bad days and I have my good days, and most, you know, the majority of my days are good so i'm i'm in a good place yes um but uh i thought you know i was i fell victim to the suffering artist fallacy to think that oh you know yeah this is sure i feel miserable but my music is coming out great (laughs) which is bullshit and then i i kind of realized that uh you know after i'd gone to therapy basically to save my life uh, I realized that, hey, you know, all the experiences that I've had, a lot of which have been miserable, yeah. um, they're still in here. Yeah. I don't have to relive them. I can, I can draw on them as fodder for my songs to write really emotionally investing songs and, and um, you know, uh, tell stories about people who are going through things, maybe not the same things that I, as I have, but people who are maybe experiencing the same emotions that I have without being there. Yes. And what that enabled me to do was then to actually start producing my music because before, yes, I was writing a lot of songs, but I didn't have the drive to follow through because of my depression. That's right. I got to a point for many years where I was like, I wasn't willing to release my music online. I'd only do CDs right. because I was like, ah, yeah, no, but I stick it online. It'll be up there permanently. And, I was doing 50 CDs an album at that point. So it was very easy for me to like give that, give out 10 to a few family and friends and sell the rest at gigs over the space of a year. Sure. And, and, and yeah, everything was fine, but yeah, it, it certainly, it wasn't any idea of commercial success. It was um, kind of uh, self-actuated success. Where I was like, well, this is as far as I want to be. And I don't want to risk, you know, uh, getting into, into deep trouble by uh, building a legacy online. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that I think is, uh, that's another thing that I always uh, talk about is, you know, that it's, uh, that's like a, a, a confidence thing. And, and, you know, like we've been talking about for, for beginners, it's just about 
getting your feet wet and learning how to get the ball rolling. Yeah. And then as you move further along, it's about keeping the ball rolling. And that's a major roadblock is, you know, uh, sabotaging yourself, uh, you know, not ha having the uh, self-esteem and the confidence to, to just follow through. Yeah. And that's that, I think, is 90 percent of having a career is just following through. And like we said, networking. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's how you. We went off on a massive tangent there. We were talking about beginners, and we're into all kinds of things. But I, oh, I, I music I, industry I like and society. Yeah, I mean, I'm a bit like this. I'm somewhat the king of tangents um, around my <laughs> parts. Um, yeah, certainly when it comes to starting off, you know, it could be a lot to think about, and I think that's why conversations like this are valuable to have because yeah. a lot of the problems that I suffered with when it came to getting over just songwriting, you know, and actually putting that songwriting to some use, I found I didn't really know a lot and there was no one around to tell me, you know, and yeah. to kind of guide me. So it's good that we have conversations like this um, so that people can tap into that and kind of go, oh, okay, it's just an industry. I can make sense of it. I don't have to do it all today. Uh, I think yeah, that's the exactly. most important thing is like, you know, having a realistic approach to growth. Uh, yeah. A lot of people, they'll release things on youtube for uh two weeks and they go oh no i'm not getting an audience i won't bother anymore whereas yeah, like, yeah. statistically five to six months is sort of like when you even start to see increase yeah. yeah yeah that's something that i'm you know i'm terribly impatient as a person mm -hmm. so so that's uh definitely one of my problems it's just it, just sticking with it just keep doing that. not when it comes to songwriting i mean that's something that i just do naturally i've been writing songs since i basically since i started to play music i was writing yeah i can't uh, see myself ever that. not writing songs even if i wasn't doing it as a job i'd still do it for fun hmm. uh, yeah i, I think absolutely a, yeah i think a lot of people um kind of see it as all in or all out but then songwriting yeah. can be a fun hobby it can uh, also be sort of a job like say in theater or in movies and stuff like that or it could be something yep. that you go, all right, I want to be in the music industry. I want to be on the scene. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's actually, you know, it's great because it's a multi-application skill that you can take and you know, put into all, all sorts of different things. Absolutely. And um, and uh, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's a skill that, that you can use. There, there are so many ways to be in, to work as a musician and as a songwriter. You know, um, and I think a lot of people, they just, they either focus on, okay, you know, writing songs for other artists or being a touring musician. Yes. But, yes. That's you know, right. Which are, of course, the two sort of major ways that artists or songwriters make yeah. a living. But there's so much else, you know, there is licensing, there is theater, there's writing jingles, there, you know, yeah. uh, the list goes on. Um, and there are a lot of people who, make a full-time living just selling albums yeah online you know that's that's a very viable way to to make a living it's it's um, interesting to see that a lot of the friends that i had around the scene when the internet started to move towards streaming they're highly successful now and they make a living out of just their streaming alone where i'm a few years behind them because i went ah oh, no i don't don't think i'll do that yet but, so yeah. it, it does go to show that if you're willing to invest the time and keep it up mm -hmm. for a number of years, then you will start to see um, full time income from it. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's all about strategy, I think. Though. I, th I think again, going back to to what we said previously, it's most of it is about finding your audience. Right. You know, that's where you need to spend most of your time because you might you might think you know you you're, you you can be pumping out your music on Spotify or on YouTube or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, and then crickets, right? Because yeah, absolutely. you're not promoting it. And, um, and it's, it, it can be a little bit hard to know, okay, so who is this music for and where do I find them? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big part of the, it's a huge piece of the puzzle that is, you know, that I, I I'll admit I struggle with that sometimes. Again, you know, I, my professional career has largely been focused on playing local places, you know, doing live stuff like that, and then uh, writing for theater. Right. You know, so, so finding 
uh, the right playlists to submit to or, you know, stuff like that. I've seen success using Facebook ads right? Uh, because there you can, you know, uh, and, and selling music because there you can easily find, okay, I want to target Tom Waits fans and right. I know they're going to, they're going to like my music. But um, other than that, you know, it's the, the secret sauce really is finding your people, finding your tribe. And like you said, you know, you need a thousand true fans. And yeah. So if you find exactly. a thousand people who really love you and are going to pay for everything you do, then you're going to be successful. That's it's right. It's going to take time and work. And it's looking at sort of that um, idea of success, isn't it? And what that means. Because for a lot yeah. of people, that means having never ending floods of money coming in and opportunities coming in, but really a more definable uh definition for success is that just not giving up just carrying on yeah. waking up and going right i'm going to carry on doing that and then another thing is just that idea of objective like what are you trying to achieve in terms of success do you want loads of money do you want people mm -hmm. to recognize you as a household name because honestly as um as a record label our business biggest successes have been viral successes that we have had no impact in creating yeah. other than yeah. releasing the music you know, we've yeah. released these songs out there and they've had hundreds of thousands of streams because they have uh, shareability. You know, yeah. uh, people listen to them, they share it with their friends, their friends like it, so they share it. And and it's annoying because you can put so much time and effort into writing a really com what you feel is a really compelling, uh, insp inspired song. And it yeah. really, even when you're marketing it, only get ten to 100,000 streams. Uh, yeah. But then <laughs> when you put your viral songs out there and market them without a penny and they start to reach like i think one of them's got about five hundred thousand streams at the moment <laughs> yeah you kind of go ah wow. oh, right okay so there's something else going on there so it really does depend what do you want to do what's what's yeah. your idea of success for your songwriting what's your what's your uh what's your objective in terms of do you want money do you want to be recognized a household name because those songs are by a friend of mine jj king who i represent mm -hmm. um and He's not a household name because of that. You know? Yeah, you could say he's had quite a bit of success, and the the, the financial implications of that have been quite nice. But no one's going around going, "Oh, have you heard JJ King's latest epic? I need a poo poo." You know, no right. one's doing that. You know? Right. Um, but they are sharing it constantly on TikTok without realizing yeah. who he is. So uh, it's it's a really important thing to get your head around. I think. Um, if you're not just starting off as a songwriter and you're thinking about taking it serious as a business, it's like, right, what are you trying to achieve then? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and, uh, and, you know, and, and reachable goals. I mean, uh, it's like having a viral success is not, uh, it's not something that's realistic as a goal because you, you have no it, control yeah. over it. Exactly. You can't control it and you can't really create it to be viral. No. It, it's like you see in the mo movie industry right now, right? Yeah. You see all these films that they're perfectly produced to be cult classics and yet they're not. And yeah. that's because they're looking at all the old cult classics go, oh, throw in a bit of that, throw in a bit of that, throw in a bit yeah. of that. And yet they're yeah. not hitting the mark because these things were cult classics because they were what they were in every way, not just because of exactly. those small details. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, and that's where, you know, it's, you know, again, uh, you know, Facebook ads, that's yes. something quantifiable. You can, you know, okay, I can, I can afford to spend this much and I need this, you know, and I can tweak things and I can test them and I can, you know, that's where you can actually have. And, and if you're, if you're selling an album for $10, then that's okay. I know that if I get this many people to end up buying, yeah. from these ads then i'll be at least breaking even and my music will be getting out there yeah our biggest so success on. our biggest success other than viral success was through targeted advertising and it, it yeah. did help us to get very specific about who we were targeting so that helped us to spend the money sending it to the right people exactly well um uh before we because we could probably talk for hours and hours i would love to come on again at things. some point and then um, i'd love to have you on again uh um, excellent thank you Avi. but uh, before we say goodbye go on uh tell everyone uh where they can find you where they can follow you uh people who are interested in your music uh people who want to pay attention once you bring out your course and so on excellent thanks um so yeah i'm on social media but i'm only on facebook and twitter so both of those are at the billy nomad uh if you go to my instagram 
uh, in the link every day in the bio there's a link to my daily blog or my nearly daily vlog uh, I try and write it every day um, and then uh, in terms of music that's also on my website which the blog is hosted on but you can go to billynomad.bandcamp.com and I'm running a deal on there at the moment where you can buy my entire discography for I'm just trying to work out what it'll be in dollars it will be about $20 um, but that's wow. that's four albums and five singles I think um, but over here that's 13 pounds and 71 pence so <laughs> right. so yeah <laughs> Do um, do feel free to grab that. It, it, it's um, a great collection of songs. There's more coming this year. I've got another song coming out next month, but we're about to start recording music video for that. Um, and yeah, there'll be an album coming out later this year. So definitely keep an eye on it. But yeah, my website, which will be going up as billionomad.net over the next month, but it's not there right now. Um, right. But yeah, check out my Instagram uh, because even the link is there uh, to the site that's still in testing mode. I do check that all right out. and i'll put uh, all the links in the uh in the show notes excellent avi you have been an absolute legend it's been really nice chatting to you yeah yeah likewise and uh welcome back anytime Thank um you. thanks uh everybody for uh watching this uh, and or listening to this depending on where you are consuming it uh don't forget to check out the website strongwriting.net and i will see you on the next episode happy songwriting <laughs>